I usually start the episode with hjärtlig välkommen. But since today's interview is conducted in English and my greeting doesn't really translate all that well, I settle for welcome. My name is Liva Bonnevi and this is part one of episode eight from Clan of the Horses, a podcast about horses and horse people. In this episode you'll meet Stormy May, an American horsewoman many Norwegians surely will recognize as the director of the acclaimed documentary The Path of the Horse. I'm not going to be handing out any dictionaries, but I feel compelled to give you three keywords before we move forward. The first is EMS. It stands for Equine Metabolic Syndrome. If you are unfamiliar with the term, just think of it as diabetes for horses. The second is laminitis, what we in Norway often refer to as forfangenhet. It is a very painful and potentially very harmful inflammation of the structure of the hoof. The third is a trainer Stormy refers to as Nevsarov. This is the Russian horse trainer Alexander Nevsarov, one of several trainers portrayed in the path of the horse, and the founder of Nevsarov Otekol, that focuses on iron-free liberty training. Stormy May used to be an accomplished competition rider and an ambitious horse trainer, but she is no longer riding her horses. To pick up a metaphor from my first podcast episode, Stormy chose not to bring neither saddle, bridle, halter, nor horseshoes when she crossed the bridge from our world and entered the world of the horses. I've really been looking forward to invite you to this talk. Um, we met for the first time in 2011 at Tina's place in Dream Valley. I uh, had a very interesting conversation and now it's been almost 10 years. And I'm really curious to know about where you stand with horses now and and how your journey has been since we last spoke. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a big question. Yeah, <laughs> it's, a <laughs> it's a big life. <laughs> um, yeah, and thank you for asking those kind of questions because that's that's how we can go deeper when we learn from each other, you know, what we've seen, what we've experienced. Um, so I guess, you know, if people have seen the Path of the Horse documentary, then they kind of know where I was 14 years ago. Um, and since then, I would say the path has gotten deeper and more into human development and seeing the horses as teachers and not as something you're going to control and manipulate. In, it's there really are really our elders they've been here longer on earth than we have and I think they are haven't lost a lot of the connection to nature and connection to nature's innate wisdom and guidance that we have so it's really turning the whole horse paradigm on its head from you know how can we use them for riding how can we use them for sport how can we use them for work how can we use them even for companionship, into how can they teach us? How can they lead us? How can we turn around and honor them for their own natural qualities, not what we can train them to do? But, I mean, even if you want to take that metaphor, what, what can they train us to do? What can they help us recover that we have lost in our, in our domestication you know, in our living in boxes and having hot and cold running water and electricity and cars, we've gone farther and farther away from that that ability to really tune into nature in the moment and feel feel where that guidance is that is nature, that is what beats our heart, that is what breathes us. So by partnering with horses in this way, we can we can learn from them by something as simple as just spending time in the pasture with them. You know, it's, it's not about how can you get them to half pass. It's, it's how can I slow down enough to listen to them, to understand them, to have this, this beautiful two way conversation with them where they can say yes, they can say no, and it's all good. You know, I, I don't, feel any worse when they say no to something I suggest than when they say yes to it. It's all an opportunity for learning and growth. But the journey um, to get there, 
to that point where we are able to be silent, when when we are able to find kind of rest in our busy lives and meet the horses. I mean, in my um, experience, a lot of people. Uh, I, I published a book right around the time you came with Path of the Horse, and um, there are similarities between our projects. And people will come to me and they've said, "I read your book, and it's." I can see that it's right, you know, that it is possible to have that kind of a connection with a horse, but um, it's too hard. It's too much work <laughs> and it's easier not yeah. to. It's like with the with Matrix, with the Neo and he's offered a blue pill and a red pill. And if you take the blue mm -hmm. pill, you can have the ignorant bliss. And if you take the red pill, then then it's going to be an inconvenient truth. And it's no turning back once you've taken the red pill. And I think in my experience, a lot of people say I, I stick with the blue. And uh, I've, for what it's worth, swallowed the red one. And once you've done it, it's too late to turn back. Is that also your experience mm -hmm. or how, how does that feel for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a great metaphor for what it is. And, and for me, just to make it real tangible for people listening, it's like you, you come, you know, it's like, oh, yes, I love riding horses. It feels great. And it's, there's such harmony. But if you actually know an individual horse, there's a lot of moments that make that up, you know? Okay, so you're gonna put the saddle on, you're gonna tie them up, you're gonna put the halter on, you're gonna put a bridle on or something. And in all those moments, the horse may say, yes, okay, or the horse may say no. And if the horse says no, are you going to then be the kind of person that finds other ways to manipulate them into that yes? And that's kind of the core of it, is, is who are you? And most people really don't, even people who work with horses long amounts of time, they don't really come to this red pill, blue pill moment because they're riding horses who are already trained. You know, if you want to get a horse, you look around and you buy one that's nicely trained and you just get on and go. And it can really seem like, yeah, the horse likes this. You know, he's excited to get out of his stall and he's you know, walking down the trail and he seems happy, you know, he puts his head in the bridle, you know, like what could be wrong? Um, but for me, I was, I was specializing in starting young horses and retraining horses. And some of them were, you know, did seem to like, okay, that's fine. We'll do it. No biggie. But some of them were just not okay with it. And especially 14 years ago, the alternatives were get stronger or send them to somebody else who's going to get stronger. Meaning, you know, you have to show them who's boss. You, ha you can't get away with that, you know, it, do it over and over and over until they give up, which is basically learned helplessness. And I just thought that was normal. I mean, that's, that's what everybody taught. But then, you know, for me, it was a couple different mares that I had. One was my own and one was sent to me for training that just were not okay with it. And the one that was my own, uh, honestly, I, I'm ashamed to say it, but we fought for 11 years before I finally said, okay, I get it. <laughs> Riding is not something that is for you. And it's not, I mean, I loved her. Obviously, I wouldn't have spent that much time with her if, if I didn't. Um, but it, it took, I, I'm really stubborn. <laughs> I've, I've softened a bit now. But then the other one I got um, kind of at the end of what I would call my training career. And for her, it, it took me about a year. And I, I could get to where I could ride her, but it was always manipulation. Still have her. She's um, 17 now. And this was when she was three. And she, she was just saying, no, 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 no. And, and you know, again, I was, I was good. I was the gentle trainer, so I could kind of manipulate her into it. But, you know, she was supposed to be sa sold as a kid's pony. And that was just not an ethical thing for her or any kid that would have gotten to work with her. So at that time, you know, this was right as I was making the path of the horse, I said, well, you know, I'm not going to send her to somebody else because I know what's going to happen. I'm going to figure this out. And that's when I sold my ranch. I, I sold, you know, everything that I had that was of value other than the horses and just stopped the way I was doing things, which included stopping riding for a period of time to explore, you know, what, what is our relationship like when riding just isn't even part of it? And that's where the horses started to open up and, and, and 
show their true selves, which weren't afraid to say no, although she wasn't afraid to say no, but um, th that were more their true being, which is they, they're very peaceful beings. They love to be in harmony with nature. They love their, their friends and their, their, you know, the grass. They love the trees. They love the sun and the nighttime. So as, as I started trying these new ways with horses, you know, based on what I had found through the different people that I had watched and interviewed in the Path of the Horse documentary and, and many that I've met since then, you know, just, just trying different ways. And the, the core was, I don't want to be a person who hurts a horse. So I don't want to even pull on a halter if I don't, if it's not truly in their best interest. You know, yes, if there's a fire and I need to get them in the trailer, I'll do whatever it takes. But most of our lives aren't that. So what does it look like when you don't have a halter on, when you don't need to be exercised by me, when you get enough exercise out in the field? And the longer I was doing that, the more I felt, first of all, this feels right in my heart. This is, this is the person I want to be. Um, and the horses confirmed it. Yes, we like you a lot better when you're, when you're acting like this versus when you're tying us and kicking us and, you know, pulling us this way and that way. Um, but then, you know, the kind of the core fear of that is, well, what will become of you if, something happens to me and you have to be sold, you know, you're going to be, have a better life if you can be ridden. And I had to question that. Is that true? I don't know. So, so I, I went the other way and just said, I'm not, I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to honor your choices. I'm going to honor your no and see how we can grow together, how we can learn together. Not even that they have to learn how I can learn from you. Um, and that's where I found like the real journey is just coming up against my own beliefs, my own concepts of what it's like to be with a horse, which pretty much the only influences we have these days are you ride them. You go to a riding school, you learn how to ride, or you watch YouTube videos about how to, how to control your horse's feet or, you know, how to how to get them in the trailer or how to do this or how to do that. But it's, it's not, it, I mean, the, the fundamental premise is I need the horse to serve me. And uh, honestly, I'm still, the horse is still serving me, but now it's in my own growth and compassion and empathy, not how can I manipulate your physical body? Do you think, because this is, this is where I kind of, what, what happened after we last met was that I bought myself a new horse. And this was a fresh horse. Not a planned thing. I just met him in a field and uh, I had to bring him home. Uh, and luckily for me, and I wouldn't say it's lucky, more faith maybe. Um, faith, he, um, he didn't want to be ridden. Not comfortable with riding at all. Um, so I spent two and a half years on the ground with him. Uh, and um, for people who have not been into this kind of thing at all, it must have been, or I, I could tell that it was strange for them. But to me, it's it's no longer possible to just get on. Uh, I have to know that we are in it together in a way. And for two and a half years, I thought I may never ride him. But what happened was that when we were out in the forest together, because I did a lot of stuff with him from the ground, um, then he wanted to go fast and I can't go that fast. So then I kind of saw a reason for riding him. Um, and then I started to ride him very gently and very, like if you are on a two hour trail ride, then it would be effectively maybe 20, 30 minutes riding and the rest of the time will be walking. So basically, more or less get on when, <laughs> when it goes too fast. <laughs> because I, you know, it's, it has nothing to do, do not, even with my best of will, I, I can't go that fast. So, so that kind of was an incentive to get on him again and, and see how that works. And it was really a question of 
like you say, it's so many pros, pieces in the process when you are supposed to ride a horse with a bridle, with a saddle, with everything. And to kind of listen to all the little things, like it took me probably a year to find a saddle. That was okay. It took me another year to find some solution with the reins. That was okay. Uh, but still, it's not... I can never go back to ride like I used to do before. Just get up and ride, ride, ride. Um, but it's, I think when you describe it as you know, putting on a halter, putting on a bridle, putting on a saddle and having that jerking and kicking, I'm thinking riding can be a lot more than jerking and kicking. And it can be also soft and it can also be communication. But I think it's, when you say manipulation, it's really, that's where I'm really looking for that balance to see when is it really, truly we're doing this together and when is it just my, yet another idea from my, you know, from my side going, I really want to ride, ride, let's go. It's, I think it's, that's really the area where I kind of find myself searching these days to find that balance. I've, I've ridden him really little from like from the fall last year and up to now. It's like seven, eight months where it's been probably not so good for him because he gets a bit fat, especially during the summer. So I'm, and then that's also a concern with EMS and stuff, you know, um, because I need to keep him healthy. But if I take him away from the grass, okay, he gets thinner. But then you have the psychological thing, you know, he needs to be with his friends. So I, I think it's, there's so many things and, and um, uh, aspects to take into the equation. When it used to be, I mean, when I started riding, when I was 13, I was such a good rider. I mean, I've, I've never been better than when I was 13. And you just put on the saddle and, and a saddle was a saddle. A bit was a bit, hay was hay, and hoof was hoof, and, and a shoe was shoe. <laughs> and now it's like, it's rocket science. Everything is rocket science. So, so personally, I, I, um, I still find myself searching to find that right place. Because when I, I had a really exper interesting experience with him last week, I, I took him out for, um, I think we were away for like two hours, and I kind of challenged him a little. Uh, I think it's important to, to challenge him to a point where I know that I'm not challenging him, uh, so it feels comfortable for him, but still I move him a little. And when I come to the pasture the next day, when I've done that, he always comes charging. He wants to go. So they also need and like to grow with us. So kind of looking for that balance where, where we're not getting greedy again or where we're not taking advantage again, but when we find, you know, balance in our on and off the horse kind of thing. It's, it's complicated, but I think, mm -hmm. I think you of all people know what I'm talking yeah. about. <laughs> yeah, well, definitely the way I explored that, you know, back kind of in 2009, after I'd stopped riding for a while, and then the the idea was then you get back on, but you do it with the horse being willing to do it. Um, and to me, the, the ultimate challenge was, can I do this with no tack? Can I just walk up to a rock and have the horse come and say, sure, get on my back, let's go. And then I just get on, no bridle, no saddle, no cordeo, no nothing, and feel safe enough that the horse is truly my partner and we can do this together. And I did get to that point, especially with the horse that you see me with in the path of the horse, Patrick. Um, you know, at that point, it had been almost two years of no riding. You know, I had started him and we were doing dressage and little jumping. But then then I started doing more what Nevzorov does and stopped the riding and just did everything without tack. And he didn't need to be exercised. He was out in a big pasture with his friends. Um, and so to me, that proved that maybe not with every horse, but some horses have this sense of like, oh, this is fine. This is not not a problem for me. And of course, we weren't going anywhere. We were just in the pasture that he lives in. So it's not like I needed to control him other than just to make me feel safe. But for me, that safety came because we were, we were having a c conversation. And for example, if he started going too fast and I was worried, I would just jump off, you know, before he got going too fast. <laughs> um, and then he'd stop immediately and look back at me and say, why are you off? And then we'd walk back to the rock and I'd get back on. 
So he learned that he can't go too fast, otherwise I'm just going to jump off, and that's not what he was looking for. But then with other horses, they just didn't say yes, you know, whether it's they had been too traumatized or they had stuff structurally or, or you know, muscularly going on that made it uncomfortable for them. They just said no, and I honored that no. Um, and I think part of what made it easy for me to honor that no is I had already been a professional horse trainer for like 30 years. So it's not like I still really had this urge, I got to ride, I got to ride. It was like, eh, you know, riding's hard on a person too. It's, it's hard on your lower back. It's hard on your shoulders. It's, you know, it's physically, yes, we can do it for therapy, but that's a very different type of riding than most of us riders do. Um, so, you know, I, I hear where, where your, it sounds like your dilemma is you, you really believe that he will have a better quality of life if you do ride him a little bit. You know, he'll get out to go, go further and go faster on these trails where he wouldn't get to go if you weren't on him. And that's, that was what I was re-examining. You know, is it really in the horse's best interest or is this something that still, it's for me, but it's not so bad for them, you know? And, and everybody's going to answer that differently. And even, you know, people try and categorize, categorize me and say like, oh, she's against riding. It's like, I don't know. I, I haven't met your horse. I haven't met all horses. The horses that I know and I've worked with, it, it's, it's, not, it's not something that I see adds to their quality of life because they're living in areas where they don't, they don't need that. They get enough exercise for what their living environment is. You know, if a person only has the resources to keep their horse in a stall in a small paddock, then that is a real question. You know, do they need to get out? Do they need forced exercise or, you know, extra exercise in order to be fit for whatever, to not get laminitis or not to get EMS or not to get whatever? And that's where, again, it comes back to what are your beliefs? You know, like um, I'm, I'm teaching a new course right now called Heartful Horse Connections. And we explore these beliefs. How much training does my horse need? How much exercise does my horse need? How much hoof care does my horse need? How much vet care does my horse need? Because when you get down to the, the fundamental level, we don't know. We'll never know. You know, like if you never rode your horse again, would he be healthier and happier than the way you're doing it? You don't know unless you try it. And you did, you gave two and a half years to trying no riding and you, you got what you got. And now you're, you're trying a little bit and you're getting what you get. So if it's, I mean, it, it comes down to you and your relationship. And if you're feeling, oh, this is good, this is fine, he's happy, I'm happy, no problem. <laughs> I mean, it's your life, do it. Um, but if you still have that little voice that comes in, it's like, is this really the right thing? I mean, because even any time you're riding, there's, there's an increased chance of injury you know, whether it's to his back or, you know, he steps in a hole or whatever, which, um, you know, out in the pasture, they can injure themselves as well, but they don't have the risk of the, you know, the compression of the, the musculature on the back or the spine, you know, the kissing spines, all that. Those are um, directly riding related. Uh, or you could even say trailering, you know, is it, how safe is it to trailer a horse? You know, it, it's, it's, probably a little bit more dangerous than driving a car because now there's a, a trailer behind the, the vehicle. Um, so if you're saying, yes, I'm doing it because he's going to be healthier, you have to kind of step back and say, I don't know, because he might be injured in other ways that he wouldn't have been if I wasn't. And would he get EMS if you didn't ride him? I don't know. He lived for two and a half years without riding and I'm guessing he didn't get EMS unless he did. He hasn't, but but he, you know, it's different with horses how how they how the fat kind of, uh, you mm -hmm. know, yeah, yeah. It's he he has he has the tendency, so I need to be aware. And 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 definitely with with I mean that's kind of like the one of the again one of the fundamental things that horse owners come up against is. Uh, and this happens to me all the time still, and luckily I know what to do with it, but this thought of, he's too fat, he's too skinny, 
his hooves need to be done. Like just these little voices. And then when you can come back and step back and come from this perspective of inquiry, like you, you really don't know. And then for me, I'll go and I'll look at my horse and it's like, they're fine. <laughs> you know, he's fine. He, he doesn't have EMS right now. He doesn't have laminitis right now. So that that's that's where it's it comes back to you and you know we are their guardians we are making so many choices for them so this is where it's our responsibility to to really question and step out of the conditioned beliefs and just look at your horse is he happy and healthy right now happy healthy and a little little bit fat no it's just it's <laughs> just that i have his teeth done in october and then it's been out eating grass since june Mm -hmm. So, so whenever my veterinarian comes, he will always see him when he's at his fattest and he will say, this is, this is unhealthy fat for a horse. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I, you know, in my experience, that is correct. So it's just a matter Mm -hmm. of how to deal with that. But I'd rather have him fat and happy living a few years Mm -hmm. shorter than being very thin and and perfectly trained and being miserable. So it's, that's an easy choice, but it's finding that balance, I think. You know. And there's other ways, just management-wise, you can set it up. Like um, my my pony does get laminitis, not every year, but sometimes. And one one thing I found that has worked really well this year, it seems to have worked, is setting up a track system. You know, so she can't just be in the whole pasture; she has to move around the track. So she's eating less, she's moving more, mm. and she doesn't have laminitis. So you know, riding is one option, but there's a lot of other management options that we can set up that that don't involve that hence i've been looking for my own farm for the last 10 years yes <laughs> yes because it's the dream yeah because if you're going to do stuff like that then you really need to have your own place or 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 yeah. with other people that have that already yeah you have just heard episode 8 part 1 of clan of the horses a podcast about horses and horse people In part two, Stormy and I will talk about the value of a silent mind and more. I want to thank my composer, Fredrik Blom, my guest, Stormy May, and last but not least, I want to thank you, dear listener, for your patience. May the horse be forever with you.